Hi, I'm Bob Gimlin. About a thousand years ago, back when we could still do things, I had some business to attend to in St. Augustine, Florida. I saw a very cool fortress there. It was winter where I left from, and I guess it was winter down there too, but it sure didn't seem like it. I had way too much fun the first night, recovered the second day, and then spent my surplus of free time over the next few days exploring the area around the Ocala National Forest. It was even more rural than I anticipated. Perhaps because I come from the land of the ice and snow, I tend to falsely associate Florida as beach towns and partying vacation spots. This was not the case in Ocala and its surrounding counties. It made my Hooverville look nearly metropolitan. I coerced some very nice people to take me out on their fan boat. It was extremely unpleasant, but I saw manatees, so that was nice. On my second to last day in Florida, I came upon a site that required further scrutiny. A gas station. Nothing nearer or closer to it for fifteen miles either way. It had only two vehicles in its lot. One, a blue Chevy pickup with not one, but two Bigfoot bumper stickers. And the other was a green Volkswagen that didn't look like a Volkswagen to me. I couldn't resist. Inside, I found a woman, maybe thirty-four to forty years old and a young man was behind the register. He was more like 19 to 24 years old, I'd say. I had a pretty good guess of which vehicle belonged to who. The woman ignored me, which is fine, I prefer it that way sometimes. Instead of filling up a basket like a normal human being, she brought her items to the counter one by one, ensuring that no one could receive service for the duration of her time within the establishment. Which was also fine, I was in no rush. I got the impression they didn't get a lot of foot traffic there. She compiled a six-pack of Bud Light bottles, a bottle of Mountain Dew, twelve eggs, a half-gallon of two-percent milk, and a large styrofoam container of boiled peanuts that smelled like excellent Cajun food but looked repulsive, as if they ought to be squirming around, or as if they had wriggled until very recently. She had pouty lips that reminded me of the bill of a duck, and a slightly upturned nose. Not a single smile line besmirched her smirk. Her expression was that of a person who was perpetually trying to look around a corner. Her sunglasses were tinted a weird pink, like when you spit and there's blood in it. I would have bet $100 that I was not the first person to find her vaguely reminiscent of a rattlesnake. Once she had gone, I conveniently lost interest in the pocket knife display and made my way to the register. The guy behind the counter looked nice. His hair was either light brown or dark blonde. I'm never sure with that particular shade, and it sprang up after dipping toward his neck. I would have called him tan, but I suppose everything is relative. It was January, after all, even though it was sunny and nearly 70 degrees. I attempted a friendly smile. From my previous trips to the south, I had learned that my standard Midwest sensibilities appear timid down yonder. Where I'm from, anything more than a one-word greeting with limited eye contact is considered a bit much, don't you think? He returned my smile, though he'd already been smiling. I asked if that was his truck outside. He looked at me skeptically and he said nothing. Apparently there was a story there, but that wasn't my concern, so I clarified that I just meant in reference to the bumper stickers. His countenance cleared, and suddenly he was quite certain that that was, in fact, his truck, and that he had indeed selected the stickers that adorned its hull. I told him that I'm from about 1,500 miles away, and that I'm an amateur Bigfoot sleuth, and I was wondering if he had any local insights. He thought about it for a minute, as if trying to recall something from a faraway place. Finally, he said that personally, he had not had any encounters. He seemed weirdly ashamed of it for some reason, though I have no idea why. Obviously, if everyone had a sighting, there wouldn't be much of a mystery, but I didn't say that. He told me they're called skunk apes in Florida, even though no one calls them skunk apes. He told me something about a beekeeper who keeps bees, and that the apiarist said that many years ago, the incessant bears suddenly became uninterested in his honey, and that a foul smell lingered in the bear's absence, at which point the apiarist put up camera traps, and the bears returned, and the smell went away. Curious, I said. Then I asked where he got his information about this stuff. He furrowed his brow, and after careful consideration... He said that he mostly just gets his info from YouTube. My voice thick with doubt. I asked if there were any good channels. Again, much thought. He said that he likes all of Joe Rogan's and Les Stroud's Bigfoot stuff. But as far as Bigfoot channels are concerned, he said that he likes Steve from How to Hunt, which he said adamantly. 
He said that he likes Thinker Thunker, which I couldn't help notice he said sheepishly. And he said he likes Bob Gimlin. But not the guy from the Patterson footage, the YouTuber, he explained. I said that's very confusing. Why do you think he did that? Are they related or something? He shrugged and said that maybe the YouTuber is an expert-level troll. We laughed, but for different reasons, his genuine mind sorrowful. I made a considerate expression as if trying to commit these bizarre names to memory. I asked if he said them in the correct order of best to worst. He said no, then he rearranged their order to my satisfaction. But then he recalled that any of the interviews with David Politis are actually the best by far, to which I happily and easily conceded. Then we talked about poor souls for a little while. Then he told me about a book that had a chapter on Bigfoot in nearby Salt Springs, even though he couldn't remember the name of the book. He said the gas station used to carry it back when gas stations carried books. Then without warning, a mutated alligator busted into the building. It hissed as the motion sensors gonged their dual beeps. I drew my three fifty seven Smith & Wesson. He drew a lever-action carbine that shot forty five Colt. We blew it back to hell. In reality, I was startled by an anole. One of those little lizards darted across the window. And I was only frightened by it because at first I thought it was a spider. And I'm not even particularly arachnophobic, but I don't like when the big ones move fast. Anyway, this entire setup was to say thanks to Florida Man for being so cool. And to let him know that I would never troll anyone. I found the book about Salt Springs he mentioned to which he couldn't remember the name. It's called Salt Springs, and indeed, there is a chapter about a rash of Bigfoot sightings in the area. Sources that aren't specifically about Bigfoot can offer an interesting perspective, seeing as they're relatively neutral on the matter. On October 11th, 1977, a pastor with the last name Waitley was collecting firewood in Salt Springs. His saw overheated, so he took a break to allow it to cool off. He heard a strange noise, like the patter of nearby deer, he'd later say. He thought nothing of it, and continued with the saw for several more minutes, before the machine cut out again. He assumed something was wrong with the chainsaw, and decided he had enough wood for the time being. As he was about to open the door to his truck, he saw a seven to eight foot tall creature standing in the palmettos. He described the creature as possessing, quote, lighter than black hair on its head and chest, not much hair on its arms, and none on its face. He said it had a flat face, a flat nose, and its eyes were sunken into deep sockets. He stared at it, and it stared at him. He was convinced there was about to be an altercation, so he went for the back of the truck where lay an axe. But by the time he retrieved it, the creature was gone. He didn't hear it take off, and he said the ground was too hard to find any tracks. He had no interest in telling police or press, but he told some friends of his, one of which, it seems, was married to a reporter at the newspaper. And that's small towns for you? I think it was Ben Franklin who said that three can keep a secret if two are dead. The only point that the pastor seemed to care to clarify was that he hadn't had a drink in 40 years. Three weeks after the sighting, and then three days after the newspaper covered it, a group of campers came forward. They said they had a disturbingly similar sighting. The campers said that they saw an eight-foot-tall creature observing their campsite within 24 hours of the pastor's sighting. They repelled it with six shots from a small weapon. Their intention hadn't been to hit it, which was good, because they didn't. And that's the gist of the Bigfoot chapter of the book. The two sightings that took place within 24 hours in October of 1977. But one would think that if such a creature not only existed, but was so emboldened for whatever reason, then there should be more sightings from the same time and area and it turns out that there are. I did some research on the BFRO's website, and within their archive, I found an unrelated but corroborating newspaper article from the same year, 1977, published on October 5th, so the article's events occurred less than a couple weeks before the sightings by the pastor and the campers. But before I get into it, I want to talk a little bit about the BFRO. When I was younger, I was very skeptical of the BFRO, and honestly, that's because I wasn't impressed with Finding Bigfoot, which I kind of thought to be their flagship representation. But now, after doing this for a number of years, I doubt anyone in the BFRO is impressed with Finding Bigfoot. So I don't think ill of the organization, rather just the show. 
The problem with that type of program is the nature of reality shows. Reality shows need to condense hundreds of hours, many days worth of footage, into 42 minutes. That is the nature of reality shows, though I can imagine nothing further from the nature of reality. Reality is complex, with lots of moving pieces and subtle nuances that simply can't be contrived in the editing room. Even with chimpanzees, it takes months if not years to establish some kind of rapport and the film crew of Finding Bigfoot would travel to a location for three days, and I have no doubt their interest was in filming, and not filming the subject of their title. I know guys who can't shoot a turkey in three days. Just as Naked and Afraid does a poor job of depicting what it's like to be naked and afraid, Finding Bigfoot does a poor job of depicting what it's like to find Bigfoot. Here's where Finding Bigfoot really went wrong, I think. The producers realize that it is much easier to make a show about Bigfoot hunters than it is to make a show about Bigfoot. And of course, that is precisely what we may expect from Animal Planet, surprisingly human, meaning Animal Planet, no longer about animals. So I'm very leery of the show Finding Bigfoot. But I still have a healthy respect for the BFRO. By this point, I've been in this subject matter long enough to know that organizing us is like trying to shepherd cats. Cats that are with some frequency, armed and or stoned. So I give tremendous props to the BFRO for managing to create a comprehensive reporting system and a long-reaching team of investigators who practice due diligence largely on their own dime. Pioneers in a field are rarely taken seriously, but things can change quickly. Anyway, I digress. The article I found on the BFRO's website from October of 77 comes from the Sentinel Star from Orlando, Florida and the newspaper article mentions three encounters from that year. First, a hitchhiker saw a massive beast lurking in the woods on US-441. He said the area was only lightly forested. Second, a security guard for an Apopka nursery said that a ten-foot-tall creature surprised him at night. It ripped off his shirt and then apparently fled. Strangely enough, the guard only made out its chest and one ear. He said the ear was small, and the hair was reddish-gray. The guard fired several shots at it as it disappeared into the orderly trees. But none of his projectiles met their mark. I'm sure it happened very fast, if indeed it happened at all. And finally, a welder in Bellevue said he saw a brownish-black, tall, hairy, man-shaped monster. He told the Orlando Sentinel, It smelled horrible, like garbage. I'm six feet tall, and it was a lot bigger than me. I'm sure the reporter from Orlando snickered and recorded these incidents with gusto, and four minutes later, he had a wonderful little article in time for Halloween. But what was he supposed to do? Follow up on it? That's not really what reporters do. No one researched the spat of sightings mentioned, and that's because there is no casual research. At least, that's what I've learned. You either have the capacity, capability, resources, and quite frankly, the nerve to shamelessly and unapologetically dedicate a large chunk of your life in pursuit of answers, or you don't. But even if you do, you won't find much, because your quarry is cunning and lucky. And even if you do take on this endeavor, even privately, a great deal of people will still have very strong opinions about you, and people seem strangely motivated towards ire these days. I'm not sure if people are actually more aggressive these days. Maybe it's just easier to do now. I get a lot of comments on my channel saying something to the effect of, If they're real, why haven't we found one by now? Everyone has cell phones. You mean they could get away every time? Condensed, my answer is usually, pretty much yeah. And that's a central theme as to why I'm less skeptical than most people. You see this? What are you gonna do? Run it down? Ask it kindly to hang out for a selfie. These creatures are allegedly hunters, and assuming their intellect is even within the margins of our own, then they understand what aiming is, be it camera or phone. A bit frightening to consider the possibility that we're discussing a creature that spends a great deal more time observing us than we spend observing it, which would indicate that it is active in the cryptic approach, not merely reactive which, in my opinion, is what we'd expect from a creature that has managed to resist description with such dedication. But let's say it does reveal itself. Then what? What are you going to do? You see this? What's your plan? Of course, as always, your plan depends on your priorities. 
and then post-citing, what are you supposed to do? Call someone who won't believe you? Or call someone who might believe you too much? So this doesn't bother me all that much. People say, why wouldn't we see them more often? Well, I'm not convinced that sightings are really all that rare. In just the Ocala National Forest area, the BFRO has some 100 reported sightings. And I'm sure I've said this before, but I'm a big believer in the silent majority phenomena. That is, in this case, the majority of witnesses and believers are just quiet. To me, sighting reports aren't even rare. I can't help but notice that many, but not all of the reports I receive, state in the first paragraph, I have never told anyone about this. So, feasibly, each witness's sighting may be less unique than he or she may think. Have you ever been surprised to learn that someone close to you knows the same secret that you thought that only you knew? And then it's great because you realize that you can talk about it because there's nothing left to conceal? There's just a chance that type of thing may be at play here. I tend to think that a conservative estimation of reports that ever get relayed or recorded is one in ten. For every ten people who observe something, I'd guess only one of them ever transmits their encounter to any archive or source of record. The reasons for this shyness are numerous, and I don't feel compelled to get into it because I find them utterly demoralizing. And again, I think one in ten is a minimal estimation. What if it's only one in one hundred? If only one in one hundred people with a sighting ever file a report, then we're looking at 9,000 sightings in just this area, going back 50 or 60 years. But these are questions for statisticians and sociologists, only one of which I give any stock to, even though it's spooky voodoo as far as I can tell. Even if half of all people with sightings document their encounters to someone who will make it available to the public, that's still a couple hundred sightings, from now until the not-too-distant past. And of course, sightings and reports of such a creature are common back into antiquity. In fact, you could argue that they were more common back then, which is more or less what we should expect from a creature that is reticent to make its presence known to people, growing more and more shy as time progresses, as the human threat multiplies at unprecedented rates, very recently when you consider we're talking about out-of-the-way places. Infrastructure in much of this country is pretty new, if you think about it. Again, most of the correspondence I receive begins with, I have never told this to anyone so I think there is a good possibility that these creatures are more pervasive than anyone really suspects. Of course, that is, if they're real at all. I read through the BFRO reports from the area. The witnesses are early morning newspaper deliverers, a middle school teacher, a woman and a realtor looking to buy a house, parents with kids, retired military, hikers and fishermen, and a lack of hunters, as it seems, which is curious. But this is one of the factors of this whole phenomena that I find particularly mind-blowing. Sometimes it seems like the alleged creatures are not all that uncommon. Perhaps they're seen with relative frequency, it's just that most people don't tell anyone. And obviously, no methodology for successful follow-up has ever been implemented, and no doubt never been thought of, which makes sense because it's almost never attempted. I actually noticed a lack of reports made by hunters, which I find curious yet oddly expected. A human-like hunter would certainly understand the intention and methodology of a human hunter. Especially if the human-like hunter has a basic understanding of projectile trajectory and lines of sight, which we know even lesser primates possess. Most, but not all, of the reports take place at night. Again, I would expect that. I don't think the alleged creatures described are nocturnal by nature just as chimps in the war-torn Democratic Republic of Congo went nocturnal to avoid warring humans. Perhaps such a species rapidly and recently became night-bound in North America. Night makes all the difference. It has long been maintained that humans and other primates are more reliant on a single sense than any other animal. Take dolphins, for example. They're another intelligent large mammal, and they too have strong vision. But their sense of sound, their echolocation, or sense of hearing, I guess, allows them to function admirably in zero-light conditions. We have no functioning in zero-light conditions. Ever been in a room with no windows and the lights go off? There is no other goal but to get to light. I think we all know that shaky, arm-flailing walk where the best we can do is hope we're not about to walk into something terrible, and perhaps hope that we're as alone as we believe to be. Even simply being acclimated to darkness would be a devastating advantage. Some have speculated that that's why pirates wore eye patches, so that one eye is constantly covered and acclimated to the gloom with a constricted pupil. 
So if you're on the deck of a ship, and the sun is bright and the water is dazzling, you could go below deck into the gloom, switch your patch, and you'd have one eye acclimated to the dark, because it takes time for your pupils to constrict and dilate. Humans are sensationally naked in the dark. Whatever it is we're discussing here, it was born in the dark. What a disadvantage we're at. Looking for a creature that has never before felt the need to flip a light switch. And then perhaps consider that the organizations out there with the toys to match are certainly on their own side of the game. There seems to be a consensus among anthropologists, at least, that our acute vision stems from our distant, tree-bound ancestors, whose lives depended on sight for depth perception, and picking out colorful ripe fruit and succulent flowers, and just as importantly, of course, for spotting the most insidious shapes and patterns known ever to exist. Then you think about how, if vision is our primary sense, then it dictates how we perceive the world, and therefore defines our consciousness. I find it intriguing that our time among fruit trees and snakes may offer our best glimpse as to why we are the way we are. It makes me wonder. Sight. It's a big deal. People say there's no way they could get away every time. I say why not. I would beat an alleged Sasquatch in chess every single time. I'd assume. I would beat a Sasquatch in checkers every single time, probably. I know for a fact that I would absolutely annihilate a Bigfoot at a computer game, every single time. It wouldn't require much effort, because I understand the rules and the complexities and mechanisms to a degree that the alleged woodwalkers cannot. Just as they understand the rules, complexities, and mechanisms of the woods to a degree that I never will, I'm not designed for it. We lost it. According to Wilderness and Environmental Medicine, the Center for Policy and Research in Emergency Medicine, and the Department of Emergency Medicine. If a person is missing in the woods for more than 51 hours, the odds of that person not being recovered alive are between 98.9 and 99.3%. We shouldn't expect to instantaneously win a game for which we are not designed to play. The term home field advantage seems like a grievous understatement. Humans are not suited for life in the woods. We're not built for it. Being alone and unequipped in the woods for any amount of time, to us, is called dying. Being alone in the wilderness unequipped, for them, is called ideal. Since our earliest days, we built structures to overcome this disparity, and as time advanced, we built monoliths to scoff at it. I've spent so many insomniatic nights driving down dark roads with no expectations, and it just kind of boggles my mind how people can be so certain that nothing can remain undetected. Even though it clearly isn't undetected, it's just unbelieved. And I'm first to admit, it's often easier to not believe. Anyway, please make sure to like and subscribe if you like what you see and hear. And as always, thanks an awful lot for listening.